So before we get started, I want to introduce us. We are professional propagandists. <laughs> and what do we mean by that? Well, if you look at these two posters, they're essentially the same thing, but they're directed for different purposes. You can propagate for bad, or you can propagate for good. If you live in Fremont, you can propagate for good. You can <laughs> propagate for bad. In our professional lives, <laughs> we, uh, we manipulate people for what we perceive as the greater good. That's what we do at our company. OK, so propaganda for good. What exactly is that? So we are sustainability marketers. That is, we're not promoting mindless consumption. We're promoting conscious consumption. And we work with sustainability-oriented companies, companies like Nature's Path, Earthbound Farms, Ben & Jerry's. And these are companies with what we call a triple bottom line, which means that we're focused not just on profit, but also on the planet, on the environment, on helping people. These are companies that are trying to do good in the world. We've seen a tremendous growth in these sorts of companies in the past 15 years. And we expect that as the world changes rapidly over the next couple decades, these companies are going to be more and more relevant. So let's say that you're a sustainability-oriented organization or company trying to do some good in the world. What do you do? How do you communicate? Well, what we want to talk about today is an enormous problem that we see these kinds of companies making over and over and over again. You would think that these visionary companies wouldn't make this mistake, but they do. So what we want to try to do today is reframe the conversation and help these companies that are trying to do good communicate better with the people they're trying to communicate with. So the main thing to know about behavior change, neurally speaking, is that it's really, really, really hard. Our brains are basically hardwired as habit machines. This is what we do. Otherwise, the world would be completely chaotic and unpredictable. Um, so as much as we may want to try to change our behaviors, we just simply don't most of the time. 95% of all of our behavior is subconscious and unconscious. It's no wonder that over 85% of new products and services fail, completely fail. Um, this is because it's really hard to change human behavior. Marketing is really hard to do successfully. And it's even harder to market to what we call the conscious consumer. So what's a conscious consumer? Um, this is probably almost everyone in this room today, I would guess. The conscious consumer, it's about 20 to 30% of the US population, depending on how you look at it. This is somebody who abides with our values. This is the person responsible for the skyrocketing growth of Whole Foods in the last 10, 15 years, the skyrocketing of Etsy. This is somebody who you're going to see hanging out at yoga studios, hanging out at farmers markets. They're going to be drinking fair trade organic coffee. They're going to be driving a Prius. So the most important thing to know about this conscious consumer is that they hate marketing. They absolutely hate it. These people are better educated and smarter than the average person, um, and they really cannot stand being forced into doing things. They feel very manipulated and very, easy, very easily. So how do we get through to this person who's going to be easily turned off by what we're doing? And to make it harder, even for us marketers, we're in a fragmented media environment where it's even harder to direct and focus a message, much less create behavior change. The average American consumes 11 hours of media a day across media channels. That includes television, computer, mobile, tablets, and print. So you can only imagine how challenging it is to reach this person, much less get about any form of behavior change. What about our conscious consumer? She's already <laughs> She's already uh, suspicious of marketing and distrustful, and yet she still needs stuff. She's a seeker <laughs> who's seeking stuff. She's seeking yoga stuff, as a matter of fact. The yoga, <laughs> the, the, yoga market, the yoga market driven by these conscious consumers has grown from 3 million people to 18 million people and $6 billion in sales in 10 years alone. And what's amazing is that this person is or crucially, this person is who we most need to speak to. She's the one that's most interested in what we're selling. She's interested in the kinds of products and brands that we're working for that aim to sort of create some larger change out there. She's looking for connection. She's looking for a little bit of control in an otherwise chaotic world. She's looking for products and solutions, new ideas. She ultimately wants to live a better life with more meaning, and she wants to do that with some sort of positive effect in the world. So how do we reach her? We're going to tell you just a brief story about a company that we've worked with recently.
Yeah, so this is actually what inspired this entire talk. So we just started working with this company that recently made a huge mistake, enormous mistake. So this company has been around for about 50 years. They were founded in the 60s, like so many companies in this space, by counterculture people who had a strong sense of values, a strong sense of mission. This is an incredible company. They've done extremely well, gotten pretty big um, over all this time, and it's for two reasons mainly. One, they have incredible products, high quality products. Another reason is because there was really nobody in the competitive space. There was really no one else doing what they were trying to do. Um, so so you have basically the situation where they're really not doing any marketing over all these years. If you go to their website or look in their product packaging, you really have no idea about all the amazing stuff they're doing. So you could have consumers who consume their stuff for years or even decades, and they have no idea about this company's strong commitment to organics or going beyond that to sustainability, to considering the entire supply chain, working with communities all over, um, you know, basically having a lot of rich and strong culture. These companies have, uh, consumers have no idea what what these companies are actually, what this company is actually up to. So it's really, imagine a, a pre-written uh, tradition culture. Imagine that you're sitting around this campfire and you're talking to yourselves, basically. And this is what they had been doing all this time. There was really no way that people could access all of this information. So, okay, we have this amazing company. What happens in the last couple of years, the competitive space is starting to get really intense. You've got all of these pretenders out there with vastly inferior products who are putting stuff out there, and consumers really are not able to know the difference. Um, so the basically, things are getting really dire for this company. They're trying to figure out, okay, what do we do? How do we deal with this situation? And so what did they do? Well, they brought in people kind of like this. They brought in a traditional marketing firm that brought traditional marketing practices to what they do. Um, so that's what you're supposed to do, right? So here you've got this amazing counterculture company um, that brings in these folks, and let's talk about what happened. Um, they unfortunately took an approach that we see people taking over and over and over again. They didn't really try to understand the company and their culture. They did it to the extent that they generally do, that traditionally marketing generally does, and so they jumped right into social media. Everyone needs a Facebook, right? Everyone needs a Twitter, everyone needs a Pinterest, you gotta have that. So they were fixated on likes. We gotta get as many likes as possible. Likes equals goodness, let's try to get those. They created this rigid, very rigid, canned, cliched content calendar. Okay, it's Wednesday. Day. Let's have a fun quote. It's Friday. Let's find out what people are doing for the weekend. The conscious consumer was not connecting. They were completely disconnected um, from this. They actually want real, rich, true content. This wasn't resonating. So they created these really shallow promotions, basically tr these contests, just trying to get people's attention. And they completely failed because people weren't connecting. And then they tried harder. They used, ran these promoted posts to try to get people engaged. And instead, they ended up um, getting all these really dubious likes, thousands of them from far flung places like Malaysia and Slovakia and Singapore and <laughs> Indonesia, places where this company was probably never going to be having any products. So it was a basically a complete fail, this whole thing. The company wasn't happy, the consumers weren't connecting, the whole thing was inauthentic, it was disconnected. Conscious consumers have a sixth sense for authenticity and this just was not it. So what's happening now in the last couple months is we've come in and we have come in as cultural anthropologists really, really going deep, trying to understand their culture, unravel their stories and what they truly have to say. Here is the essence of what we're saying today. To communicate successfully in the future on behalf of companies and brands and organizations that are trying to do good in the world and trying to create behavior change, we need to reframe the way we think about everything. We need to say we are not talking here about creating content. We're talking about communicating culture. And this may seem just like wordplay or semantics, but it's not. It's actually a profound difference. So what do we mean? Well, I'm going to talk about culture, like in, in 30 seconds, <laughs> and tell you what culture is, and then we can contrast that to content. So culture is something that naturally flows out of a group of people in the act of simply living. Culture has its own distinctive myths and lore and gods and language and rites and rituals and secret words. Culture is what makes sense of this. You've got this giant holding a canoe, holding an enormous scarab, holding the sun with people tumbling around with glyphs. It makes sense of all that. Culture is deep. It's multi-layered and it's alive and it's ever-changing. It's always best understood by those who really live it. So if we want to communicate authentically, if we really need to tap into authentic culture and tune into what's actually going on, because this is what the conscious consumer really connects with. For her, it's all about shared values. It's all about shared culture. And we need to focus on stories with richness and depth and history. This is what we really need to bring to life in our communications.
So what about content, on the other hand? Well, content is king has become a cliche. Content is everywhere. I need to get me some content. Let's fill it with content. Content here, content there, content everywhere. Content is king. It's become a cliche. It's gotten to the point where content is filling space for people. We see that more and more. It's filling space more than it is actually connecting with any deeper cultural connection with the brand or the company. And that's really the problem here, is that <laughs> we, we see too much of this content being used to fill space just for the sake of it, as opposed to finding the value in what we really have to say and making a connection in our communications with our prospective customers in a deeper values-based way. This is what we're missing, and this is, this is the blank that we don't want to fill for just a minute. <laughs> what we see as an example of this is uh, uh, companies that bring in, let's say, a 22 or 23 year old MBA intern, and they'll put them on the community management job as a way to sort of give them something to do. It's sort of like there's no risk involved with that. They can't get in any trouble. Let's just put them on the community management. They're running Facebook, they're running Twitter, they're running Tumblr, Pinterest. And to me, that seems very strange because this is in some ways the biggest opportunity for the company to communicate with their prospective customers. This is the channel through which they can communicate their cultural difference and connect with people that share that same culture. Worse still, what companies do is hire agencies, advertising agencies, PR firms, branding firms, marketing firms, with whom they share no cultural connection. So there is a disconnect, and yet they hire those firms because that's what they're supposed to do. And it's really hard to find firms that sort of really deeply share your values and uh, where there's, a, where there's a, a shared sense of, of culture and mission. So you can imagine the disconnect that happens when, and this happens all the time. We see it, it, it's a standard thing. We end up with the ad agencies or the marketing firms that can only go so deep at connecting with, with those firms. With those Customers, And this is, in the end, what we, we, we sort of end up with this idea in a nutshell, where you know, we've got Don versus <laughs> Shaman, and uh, it's, it's, it's really a sad situation. So things are different. It's a different world out there today, and the conscious consumer is a, is a systems thinker. So she's thinking not just about the jacket. She's thinking more than just how it looks on her and more than what she's saving. She's thinking about the company that made the jacket. She's thinking about the values of that company. She's thinking about where that jacket was made. She's thinking about the sourcing of that jacket, the end of life of that jacket. And so she's thinking about a lot more things. Which of these two ads do you think is gonna resonate more with our conscious consumer? Which one has more cultural relevance to her? So we have to stop thinking about just creating content. We have to stop thinking about ourselves as marketers. We feel that anyone who speaks for a company in any way, whether they are an external agency or part of an internal marketing department, needs to start thinking of themselves as a minister of culture. And this idea is particularly powerful for values-based companies and organizations because these are the companies that actually care or are supposed to care about what they're doing. It's not just a matter of doing your job. And through this lens, you can really see what went wrong with this client of ours. Here they were and they hired this organization to speak from them, to be their mouthpiece when it was not authentic at all. It was artificial, it could never feel authentic, and it was not gonna serve the brand, the company, or the mission. So in the same way that countries have ministers of culture that serve to protect and promote the culture of that country. We also believe companies need to think about having ministers of culture to protect and serve ultimately their culture. That is in the long run what's best for their survival. So the Patagonia example again, this is one of their dirt bags. This is what they call their, their Patagoniacs, these people internally to the company that live, eat, and breathe the company. They climb, they surf, they fish, they snowboard, uh, they, you know, they, they are the people at the helm of the social media and the community management tools within the company. They're the people that are disseminating culture. They're the people that are putting their authentic lives out there in these channels. So culture is ultimately not something that, uh, that, that is, a is a, a disconnection, a professional dis disconnection. 
um, an obligation, a professional obligation. It's something that is inevitably who we are. It comes out of who we are. It is who we are. This is, uh, uh, Yvonne Chouinard speaks in his book about how uh, uh, just randomly on certain days around the campus in Ventura, a, an alarm will go off, uh, uh, you know, just in the middle of the day, and people across the campus will just get up from their cubicles, get up from their offices, get up from the lunchroom, just get up and walk out. They'll walk out of, the, in the middle of a meeting, they'll pick up their surfboards and everyone will just head for the surf because ultimately that means that surf's up and they know that they will have to get back to their job and finish, you know, when, when you know, later on that night or on the weekends. To me, that is an, the essence of what culture is all about. And if we think about this as a lens for companies, um, it culturally, is it inherently and uniquely who we are? And is the communicator and the messenger so steeped in the culture of the company that it's inevitable that they will, that it will come out and, and they will communicate it as, as to who they are? And I think a great way to uh, end, the quote, uh, end this talk is this quote from Rick Ridgeway. We don't think about marketing, we just tell our stories. Thank you. <laughs>